Hi folks, uh, my name's Joe Norton. I'm a Corps of Engineer fish biologist. Been working for the Corps about a year. Um, our next uh, presentation is on the seasonal effects of transport, a uh, long-term study as well. Um, I wanted to say a couple words. Are we ahead of time? Uh, I wanted to say a couple words uh, before we start. If I get the, if I look down there and get the hook, I will stop. Um, but like I said, I've been with the Corps about a year, and uh, as I was preparing things about a year or so ago, I had uh, somebody say to me, uh, why are we doing uh, the study all spring runoff is the same? And of course, uh, that person uh, was not a biologist or a policy or anything like that. It was just, a, just another employee. Um, and of course, as we're seeing, you know, all of these uh, seasons are different. Uh, this year, I would say, was uh, last year was very unique. Uh, we had uh, court-ordered uh, gas cap spill. We had uh, a new juvenile bypass system. Uh, and then there's other factors, snowpack, runoff, hatchery health, uh, release timing, turbidity. Um, and so that's why we're doing these things. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I kind of look at the fish. Uh, I spent many years in retail. I look at the fish as being our customers. And uh, we want to give them the best experience we can. We want those juveniles to uh, make it down through the system, make it to the ocean. And we'd like them to return as adults and not only return as adults, we'd like their kids to come down and experience things too. So, uh, so that's kind of the way I look at things. You know, there's always things we can do to tweak and, and make their experience better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's far beyond me as far as policy on what happens, you know, in our system in the future. Um, but I wanted to just take that, uh, take some time and, uh, Thank everybody here in the room. I know you're all here because you want our customers to have a better experience too. And so thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to reintroduce Steve. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to try not to be too much like Sears. Um, okay, so um, we'll switch from a lot of this juvenile survival here into uh, uh, one talk about um, results of the smolt transportation program. And again, this is uh, well, um, this is another study that uh, that has used data going back uh, nearly as far as uh, as we can go. Um, I have uh, done similar analyses on uh, migration years back to 1997. Um, Mercifully, I won't be showing all of them today. I'm just going to be talking about the updates in, for the last, uh, uh, since last year. Um, so I'll be talking about migration years 2014 through 16, um, using adult returns through last week. Um, there probably are a few more uh, since I ran that report, mostly steelhead, but not a whole lot. Um, each year, I'm able to add one more migration year because we have the two ocean fish uh, still not complete, but enough to start looking at uh, patterns in, in uh, return ratios. And I'll talk about fish that were transported from Lower Granite, Little Goose, and Lower Monumental Dams. Um, okay, so uh, just uh, jumping into this as a seasonal uh, analysis, um, which by which we mean we want to look at patterns within a season. Do um, does the relationship between transport uh, returns of transported fish and bypassed fish change throughout the season? Well, we need to have a time stamp of when the fish uh, were did, were um, migrating, and uh, I'm using um, again all the fish that come come down from the Snake River Basin. Um, and then we look at uh, we then look at the, those fish that were detected at Lower Granite, so that we have so that we do know, or I'm sorry, at Lower Granite or the other transport dams, so that we know the date that they were there. Um, so that means we're using fish that did enter the juvenile bypass system um, at one of the dams. Uh, we we use uh, fish that were tagged upstream of Lower Granite or um, collected and tagged at Lower Granite. Um, 
because of the need for a uh, time stamp, um, the, the group that we compare to the transported fish are fish that actually went through the bypass system and were returned to the river. I'm going to call them bypassed um, today. Um, call that group B, or in the, in the terms of the comparative survival study, those are C1 fish. Um, we might also be, wish we could uh, uh, do our comparisons against those that never went through a bypass system, which are the C0 fish. We have data, accumulated data, that say that, that uh, the C0 fish return at a higher rate than the C1. So um, when we assess our, our T versus C1 fish, we take into account the fact that that C1 is actually lower than the C0. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about comparing against standards today, but that's, that's basically how we, uh, how we deal with that. Um, I'll just go real quick through here. So this is, again, the transportation uh, study is not, uh, we didn't tag fish specifically uh, or upstream from granite specifically for this study. We use the available data as it comes down. Um, so we can use the dates for when that data uh, occurred. Uh, I'm just going to be talking about uh, descriptive patterns of the, uh, of the um, small to adult returns throughout the season. I'm not going to be talking about correlation with uh, um, environmental factors today. Um, I mentioned that one. Um, and uh, since I'm dealing with adult returns, counts at Lower Granite Dam, uh, it'd be con um, the, the, uh, those are survival rates are um, uh, possibly the mortality re re uh, represented in those, in those survival rates is, could be uh, confounded with strain. I'm not going to be talking about strain analyses today. And these analyses are, are numerous. Um, at this point, I'm still, I'm still um, doing uh, so four species and rearing types, wild and hatchery, Chinook and steelhead. We have three dams. We have 19 years of data. It's 228 data sets that I'm still analyzing individually. Um, the promise of the multi-year analysis will have to wait another year, but I think it will happen. Um, OK, so we'll get into the data here. Um, so we talk about, as I said, 2014 through 2016. So I wanted to briefly just um, uh, des describe what those uh, kind of water years were for the juveniles. So in 2014, uh, was for flow and spill was nearly a spot on average kind of a year. Um, the water temperature was actually slightly cooler um, than, um, than the average years. 2015, of course, was a very low flow year. Um, where uh, spill percentages were high, um, reaching 50% for some parts of the season, and, uh, and the water was very warm. Uh, 2016 uh, was an overall an above average year, but as I mentioned during the previous talk, it was kind of a flat pattern where it didn't, um, it didn't rise through May like, uh, like flow usually does. Um, average spill year and, um, and warm water, although not as warm as 2015. So just if you want to keep that little um, depiction in mind as we go through. Oh, and I also wanted to talk about, I'm going to be showing results of uh, two, two types of um, estimates. One is going to be the results of some um, regression estimates um, based on daily data. Um, so those are going to be lines and curves. And then those plots also have some points that are based on weekly uh, accumulated data, just to illustrate where the what the what the actual data look like. It's not so the regression estimates are based on daily data. The points I'm showing uh, are weekly. I don't show the daily points because they're far too noisy. Um, but when we start accumulating data like that, and we run into, especially in this data set, for some of the um, later weeks. Um, we run into situations where we have no adults returning from, um, from a certain week. And so I'm going to be using, I'm going to show you uh, what's called a median unbiased estimator. This is my solution for the zero counts. Um, this is a, an estimator that takes into account how many trials there were or how many fish were in the week. So if we get no adults from 10 fish, not a big surprise. Um, that can easily happen even if we have, you know, we're, we're dealing with usually low percentages. That can uh, easily happen with low uh, true SARs. And in fact, the median unbiased estimator, if you have no 
adults returning to, from 10 fish would be a 3% uh, return. But it also, instead of just having 0% uh, regardless of the number of trials, the median unbiased estimator um, adjusts and says, okay, well, if we had 100 fish and no adults, then we think that the, probably the true SAR is lower. Um, if, you know, and then through a thousand. And the, the advantage of this is that you always have an SAR estimate that's non-zero, and you can always do the ratio of estimates. The ratio estimator already always exists. But it does get weird because if we have, if we took three weeks in a row that had a hundred uh, juveniles and no adults, that each one of those weeks would have this estimate. But then if we summed them together, we'd have zero out of 300, and we'd save the estimate for the three weeks as that. And it's just uh, just a, a product of having to use those zero counts. And there's no, there's no perfect uh, solution for any of that. OK, so uh, okay, I'm going to be showing a series of these. Um, hope you can your blood sugar's high enough to get through them. Um, so this is migration year 2014. And these are all SAR estimates. Um, green points and lines are for transported fish. Uh, blue ones are for bypassed fish. Um, wild Chinook, hatchery Chinook, wild steelhead, hatchery steelhead. And uh, so uh, I tend to kind of focus on these, uh, on these uh, regression curves um, and look, look to see where, um, how far separated those are. From each other, you can also see the those weekly points, and in the cases where I've made an estimate with zero adults, I've used an alternate um, plotting point there. It shows those open circles. Um, so, all right. So now, now we're oriented. We just see that uh, across the board uh, for 2014, um, all species and stocks um, had higher. Um, higher SARs for the fish that were transported in May. And of course, that line starts when transportation started. Um, okay, this is, I'm sorry, the previous one was for lower granite in 2014. This is little goose in 2014. Uh, you can see that the, the uh, perhaps the benefit of transport uh, for Chinook was a little bit smaller at little goose than it was at granite, but it was still there. Steelhead is very similar. Uh, this is for Lower Monumental in 2014. The Chinook um, seemed to have the, the SARs for transport and bypass fish, fish seemed very similar uh, for Chinook. Again, steelhead was a was a sort of separation there. I'll show you a couple of these. Um, this is the okay. So up here in the upper left is the same data that I just showed you for Lower Granite Dam for Wild Chinook. It's a different. Um, scale on the y-axis. Instead of going to 4, it goes to 2.5 here. Um, and then below, this heavy red line here is the ratio between those two regression lines for the SARS. And so that is our estimate for the TB ratio throughout uh, the period when fish were being transported in 20, from granite in 2014. So. When it started on May 1st, those earliest, those first fish that were transported had almost uh, five times the SAR as bypassed fish, um, and it decreased, but it stayed above four throughout the whole season. Uh, interestingly, for fish tagged at lower granite, there wasn't there wasn't that difference, and that's their line right there. Don't have a, a real explanation for that. Usually, if it, if there's a difference, it usually goes the other way. But this. Wild Chinook from above with the SAR above four was one of the highest we'd, we'd ever seen. Um, okay, this is the same thing for Little Goose, except that um, now I've, I've summed the fish tagged upstream of granite and those tagged at granite and put them into one plot here. Um, this scale goes only up to, to one and a half percent. Um, and there's the the TB ratio through time. So starting at about 1.5 and, and increasing steadily throughout May. I'm not going to show the LOMO uh, partly because the, the, there's a, a lot less data there. Uh, so this is, I, I will show for steelhead. This is wild steelhead in 2014. Same thing again. We've seen this plot before uh, because of the higher estimates for some week. I've left the scale at 4. And, um, and there's the TB ratios for tagged 
upstream from lower granite and tagged at lower granite. So um, between two and a half and, and four throughout May for wild steelhead from granite. And a similar deal for uh, little go wild steelhead from little goose in 2014. Okay, 2015, we'll go through these quickly. 2015 has very, uh, in that very low flow year, um, very few fish that were bypassed during May have returned. And I'll, have a, I'll show you a table here in a minute. I'm going to uh, run through these anyway. Uh, even, these are usually based on, on uh, very few adults, even for the transported fish, um, but especially for the bypassed fish. Uh, but we see, uh, and a lot of these have zeros, zero adults down here, um, and uh, especially for wild steelhead. Um, there's a little goose, so they're getting a little, again, the transport's all higher, lots of zeros down here, uh, kind of a little bit uh, noisier because of the low number of adults. Down here, we're getting very, very few. Don't look at that one. And I, and I debated about putting this one up at all, but I did show it last year, and I got a lot of compliments for, um, for uh, there, there were all zeros here, so I actually made, made information out of, out of no information. But I was, I was going to not show it here. I mean, that's a joke. Um, but I, I decided to throw it in because in 2018, one bypassed fish returned from, from that week. So just wanted to show that uh, it did pop in there. But I'm going to, I will show it then. Here are the actual numbers that all of this is based on. Um, so this is for uh, fish transported or bypassed at Lower Granite Dam from May 1st to June 4th. Um, 680 juveniles were transported. Juvenile Wild Chinook, 873 were bypassed. Um, the uh, returns are nine transported and zero bypassed. There's that median unbiased estimator for the bypassed return. Uh, and one three ocean returned um, in 2018. Um, so the rest of it is fairly self-explanatory, but the TB ratio based on that whole month for wild chinook is, is 34. So um, bypass fish didn't do well in the, in the warm, low flow of 2015. And steelhead is, is different though. There's one of each that has returned as an adult with a, a, a TB ratio basically indistinguishable from one. Little goose is very similar. Again, one fish returned in 2018 uh, for wild chinook. TB ratio of about 22, but again, for wild steelhead, uh, not much difference. Transported fish didn't do very well either. And there's Lomo showing no adults returning from any of the groups from the low numbers of juveniles that were, that were still being collected there. So I'm not going to show you the ones with the red uh, lines because they don't work at all. But here's the new data from 2016. Um, again, wild chinook, hatchery chinook, wild steelhead, hatchery steelhead. Uh, we see, again, quite a bit higher uh, SARs, although uh, uh, absolutely not high, uh, but transported was higher than bypass for both um, types of chinook. Not so much for wild steelhead. Uh, hatchery steelhead, yeah, probably. That's lower granite. This is little goose. Uh, similar situation, except that the wild steelhead did uh, seem to have benefit from transport from little goose. And there's Lomo, very similar. I will show the TB ratio plots here. This is for wild chinook in 2016. So again, it's between two and three throughout May for fish tagged upstream. For fish tagged at granite, I didn't bother putting it on the plot because you can see it's a very, very big difference there. Uh, then little, little goose, again, we have a, a very high peak of a TB ratio that uh, went up above seven. Um, and except for the very end of May, we have an estimate that, uh, that the transport fish did much better than the, than the in-river. Uh, why, oh, I'm sorry, did I say wild steelhead? That's little goose, wild chinook at little goose. Wild steelhead at lower granite um, that we show here that um, not that much difference, but it does amount to a ratio of about 1.6. Uh, 
60% higher returns for transported fish. Um, there's little goose, a uh, much bigger difference there. Um, so I don't usually do this, but I thought it was interesting. We haven't looked at this kind of data for a while, or at least I haven't presented it. Um, so um, that's the conclusion of the seasonal stuff, but I thought it would be worth it to look at some the, the annual sums. And so what I've done here for Wild Chinook, okay, so these are the SARs with bootstrap 95% confidence intervals for the bypassed fish during April, basically. So this is before transport started. Uh, just uh, to show you what those look like, and we, they tend to be higher, as we've seen in so many of those uh, plots, the SARs decrease through time. Uh, so these tend to be higher than the bypass SARs during May or during the transport period, and those are in this column. Here we have the um, transport SARs, and then maybe the, um, the payoff here, bottom line, is these TB ratios uh, during May. Um, and so for wild Chinook at Lower Granite, these are very high historic estimates um, for all three of those most recent years for which we have data. Um, little Goose are similar, a little bit lower. Um, Lomo uh, can't estimate for 2015 and noisier for the other years, but again, uh, well above one. Well, I guess that first one is uh, certainly for 2016, well above one. Wild steelhead um, has, uh, are, are actually a little bit lower than the, the historic average for lower granite, um, if you average those three. Um, and uh, uh, you can see the rest of them yourselves. But um, we had been seeing, until, up until 24, like through 2013, we had been seeing a decrease in overall TB ratios, i.e. The, the benefit of transportation had uh, appeared to be decreased during the period since the court-ordered spill began and, and in-river fish uh, uh, presumably began surviving at a higher rate. But these last few years were back up to um, a historic average or maybe even above. Um, Okay, yeah, so just a uh, uh, quick summary. 2014, the TB ratio was above 3 for Wild Chinook at Granite and Goose, between 2 and 3 for Steel, and this is throughout the season. 2015, SARs were about 1% for transported fish from, the, you know, from that low flow warm year, um, very near 0 for Wild Chinook uh, that were bypassed. Data for Steelhead, I'd say, is not really good enough to give a summary like this in 2015, um, although if you had to, you'd say it was similar. 2016, TB ratio is, uh, I shouldn't have said six, that was, uh, it should be three, I'm not sure, but greater than three for Wild Chinook at all three dams. Maybe it was even two, somewhere in there. Um, for steel, uh, that should be for, for steelhead, uh, or no, so for, yeah, for steelhead, the TB ratio is between one and one and a half at granite, and about three um, for a little goose. Uh, so broader summaries, results tend to be very similar overall for lower granite and little goose patterns, and about 80% of all the fish that are transported are transported from one of those two dams. Uh, Lomo only gets 20 to 25% of the total, um, and uh, and tend to be tend to have the lower ratios. Um, not sure, this is some of these conclusions that were held over from last year, I'm not sure, I'm not con entirely convinced that this one is still true. We did see some curves and some trends in uh, 2016. Um, it used to be much more common that the, that the TB would be close to one around May 1st and then rise quickly toward the end of May. It doesn't do quite like that anymore. Um, Again, it's a higher than average TB ratios in, in uh, May of 2014 and 2016 and much higher in 2015. Um, and we, I didn't show any data on this, but we, there is a trend for a higher percentage of fish to be moving out of the Snake River Basin earlier in the season into April. And uh, the TB ratio stuff shows that this, these flatter lines, as soon as we start transporting, it seems like those transported fish get a benefit. Um, and um, so... 
for about 10 years there, though, we didn't, uh, we didn't gather much data during April. But in, uh, as I mentioned before, in 2018, uh, transportation started about a week earlier in April. And uh, so we will have, uh, we'll have more data and earlier data to uh, what's going on in April uh, when I'm here two years from now. So. Uh, next for this is to do a multi-year analysis with the parameters tied across the years and, uh, and um, we'll be uh, updating, it's been several years since our last uh, summary report, we'll be updating that over the next um, six months or so. And that is all. Hi. Um, what is the best explanation for why there tends to be a higher um, benefit of transport from Lower Granite than Lower Monumental? And like in the past, like that's why we abandoned McNary transport. Like, or I. I um. Yeah, so, Mc, well, yeah, McNary transport for spring migrants. I don't know, when's the last time that was done, Tiffany? 2012 for spring migrants? Yeah, okay. Um, I might not be, I, I might actually open that to the to the floor if anybody has a, uh, I, I mean, I think one thing that comes to mind is that um, fish that are transported I mean, if, if, we, if the purpose of transporting smolts is to uh, have them avoid dam passage, reservoir and dam passage mortality, then it seems like the earlier you get them, the more of that mortality they will be avoiding. And uh, so just on first principles, you would expect the, um, um, you know, if, if they're surviving in the, in the barge and, and uh, not having uh, too much problem after they're released, you would expect uh, a higher ratio, uh, a bigger difference the higher up the river they were transported from. Okay. <laughs> 